chapter eight of recollections and letters of general robert e lee by robert e lee jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the surrender fort fisher captured lee made commander-in-chief battle of five forks retreat of the army of northern virginia farewell to his men the general's reception in richmond after the surrender president davis hears the news lee's visitors his son robert turns farmer the year eighteen sixty five had now commenced the strength of that thin gray line drawn out to less than one thousand men to the mile which had repulsed every attempt of the enemy to break through it was daily becoming less the capture of fort fisher our last open port january fifteenth cut off all supplies and munitions from the outside world sherman had reached savannah in december from which point he was ready to unite with grant at any time from general lee's letters official and private one gets a clear view of the desperateness of his position he had been made commander-in-chief of all the military forces in the confederate states on february the sixth in his order issued on accepting this command he says deeply impressed with the difficulties and responsibilities of the position and humbly invoking the guidance of almighty god i rely for success upon the courage and fortitude of the army sustained by the patriotism and firmness of the people confident that their united efforts under the blessing of heaven will secure peace and independence general beauregard who had so ably defended petersburg when it was first attacked and who had assisted so materially in its subsequent defence had been sent to gather troops to try to check sherman's advance through the carolinas but beauregard's health was now very bad and it was feared he would have to abandon the field in a letter to the secretary of war dated february twenty one eighteen sixty five my father says in the event of the necessity of abandoning our position on james river i shall endeavor to unite the corps of the army about burkeville footnote junction of south side and danville railroad end note so as to retain communication with the north and south as long as practicable and also with the west i should think lynchburg or some point west the most advantageous place to which to remove stores from virginia this however is a most difficult point at this time to decide and the place may have to be changed by circumstances it was my intention in my former letter to apply for general joseph e johnston that i might assign him to duty should circumstances permit i have had no official report of the condition of general beauregard's health it is stated from many sources to be bad if he should break down entirely it might be fatal in that event i should have no one with whom to supply his place i therefore respectfully request general johnston may be ordered to report to me and that i may be informed where he is in a letter to the secretary of war written the next day but you may expect sheridan to move up the valley and stoneman from knoxville as sherman draws near roanoke what then will become of those sections of the country i know of no other troops that could be given to beauregard bragg will be forced back by schofield i fear and until i abandon james river nothing can be sent from this army grant i think is now preparing to draw out by his left with the intent of enveloping me he may wait till his other columns approach nearer or he may be preparing to anticipate my withdrawal i cannot tell yet everything of value should be removed from richmond it is of the first importance to save all powder the cavalry and artillery of the army are still scattered for want of provender and our supply and ammunition trains which ought to be with the army in case of a sudden movement are absent collecting provisions and forage some in western virginia and some in north carolina you will see to what straits we are reduced but i trust to work out on the same day in a letter to my mother he writes after sending my note this morning i received from the express office a bag of socks you will have to send down your offerings as soon as you can and bring your work to a close for i think general grant will move against us soon within a week if nothing prevents and no man can tell what may be the result but trusting to a merciful god who does not always give the battle to the strong i pray we may not be overwhelmed i shall however endeavour to do my duty and fight to the last 
should it be necessary to abandon our position to prevent being surrounded what will you do you must consider the question and make up your mind it is a fearful condition and we must rely for guidance and protection upon a kind providence about this time i saw my father for the last time until after the surrender we had been ordered up to the army from our camp nearly forty miles away reaching the vicinity of petersburg the morning of the attack of general gordon on fort stedman on march twenty fifth my brother and i had ridden ahead of the division to report its presence when we met the general riding traveller almost alone back from that part of the lines opposite the fort since then i have often recalled the sadness of his face its careworn expression when he caught sight of his two sons a bright smile at once lit up his countenance and he showed very plainly his pleasure at seeing us he thanked my brother for responding so promptly to his call upon him and regretted that events had so shaped themselves that the division would not then be needed as he had hoped it would be no good results followed gordon's gallant attack his supports did not come up at the proper time and our losses were very heavy mostly prisoners two days after this sheridan with ten thousand mounted men joined grant having marched from the valley of virginia via staunton and charlottesville on the twenty eighth everything being ready general grant commenced to turn our right and having more than three men to our one he had no difficult task on that very day my father wrote to my mother i have received your note with a bag of socks i return the bag and receipt the count is all right this time i have put in the bag general scott's autobiography which i thought you might like to read the general of course stands out prominently and does not hide his light under a bushel but he appears the bold sagacious truthful man that he is i enclose a note from little agnes i shall be very glad to see her to-morrow but cannot recommend pleasure trips now on april first the battle of five forks was fought where about fifty thousand infantry and cavalry more men that were in our entire army attacked our extreme right and turned it so that to save our communications we had to abandon our lines at petersburg giving up that city and richmond from that time to april ninth the army of northern virginia struggled to get back to some position where it could concentrate its forces and make a stand but the whole world knows of that six days retreat i shall not attempt to describe it in detail indeed i could not if i would for i was not present all the time but will quote from those who have made it a study and who are far better fitted to record it than i am general early in his address at lexington virginia january nineteenth eighteen seventy two general lee's birthday eloquently and briefly describes these six days as follows the retreat from the lines of richmond and petersburg began in the early days of april and the remnant of the army of northern virginia fell back more than one hundred miles before its overpowering antagonist repeatedly presenting front to the latter and giving battle so as to check his progress finally from mere exhaustion less than eight thousand men with arms in their hands of the noblest army that ever fought in the tide of time were surrendered at appomattox to an army of a hundred and fifty thousand men the sword of robert e lee without a blemish on it was sheathed forever and the flag to which he had added such lustre was furled to be henceforth embalmed in the affectionate remembrance of those who remained faithful during all our trials and will do so to the end colonel archer anderson in his address at the unveiling of the lee monument in richmond virginia may twenty ninth eighteen ninety speaking of the siege of petersburg and of the surrender utters these noble words of the siege of petersburg i have only time to say that in it for nine months the confederate commander displayed every art by which genius and courage can make good the lack of numbers and resources but the increasing misfortunes of the confederate arms on other theatres of the war gradually cut off the supply of men and means the army of northern virginia ceased to be recruited it ceased to be adequately fed it lived for months on less than one-third rations it was demoralized not by the enemy in its front but by the enemy in georgia and the carolinas 
it dwindled to thirty five thousand men holding a front of thirty five miles but over the enemy it still cast the shadow of its great name again and again by a bold offensive it arrested the federal movement to fasten on its communications at last an irresistible concentration of forces broke through its long thin line of battle petersburg had to be abandoned richmond was evacuated trains bearing supplies were intercepted and a starving army harassed for seven days by incessant attacks on rear and flank found itself completely hemmed in by overwhelming masses nothing remained to it but its stainless honour its unbroken courage in those last solemn scenes when strong men losing all self-control broke down and sobbed like children lee stood forth as great as in the days of victory and triumph no disaster crushed his spirit no extremity of danger ruffled his bearing in the agony of dissolution now invading that proud army which for four years had wrested victory from every peril in that blackness of utter darkness he preserved the serene lucidity of his mind he looked the stubborn facts calmly in the face and when no military resource remained when he recognized the impossibility of making another march or fighting another battle he bowed his head in submission to that power which makes and unmakes nations the surrender of the fragments of the army of northern virginia closed the imperishable record of his military life from the london standard at the time of his last illness i quote these words relating to this retreat when the army of northern virginia marched out of the lines around petersburg and richmond it still numbered some twenty six thousand men after a retreat of six days in the face of an overwhelming enemy with a crushing artillery a retreat impeded by constant fighting and harassed by constant hordes of cavalry eight thousand were given up by the capitulation at appomattox court house brilliant as were general lee's earlier triumphs we believe that he gave higher proofs of genius in his last campaign and that hardly any of his victories were so honourable to himself and his army as that of his six days retreat swinton in his history of the army of the potomac after justly praising its deeds thus speaks of its great opponent the army of northern virginia nor can there fail to arise the image of that other army that was the adversary of the army of the potomac and who that once looked upon it can ever forget it that array of tattered uniforms and bright muskets that body of incomparable infantry the army of northern virginia which for four years carried the revolt on its bayonets opposing a constant front to the mighty concentration of power brought against it which receiving terrible blows did not fail to give the like and which vital in all its parts died only with its annihilation general long in speaking of its hardships and struggles during the retreat thus describes how the army looked up to their commander and trusted him to bring them through all their troubles general lee had never appeared more grandly heroic than on this occasion all eyes were raised to him for a deliverance which no human power seemed able to give he alone was expected to provide food for the starving army and rescue it from the attacks of a powerful and eager enemy under the accumulation of difficulties his courage seemed to expand and wherever he appeared his presence inspired the weak and weary with renewed energy to continue the toilsome march during these trying scenes his countenance wore its habitual calm grave expression those who watched his face to catch a glimpse of what was passing in his mind could gather thence no trace of his inner sentiments no one can tell what he suffered he did in all things what he considered right self he absolutely abandoned as he said so he believed that human virtue should equal human calamity a day or two before the surrender he said to general pendleton i have never believed we could against the gigantic combination for our subjugation make good in the long run our independence unless foreign powers should directly or indirectly assist us but such considerations really made with me no difference we had i was satisfied sacred principles to maintain and rights to defend for which we were in duty bound to do our best even if we perished in the endeavour 
after his last attempt was made with gordon and fitz lee to break through the lines of the enemy in the early morning of the ninth and colonel venable informed him that it was not possible he said then there is nothing left me but to go and see general grant when some one near him hearing this said o oh, general what will history say of the surrender of the army in the field he replied yes i know they will say hard things of us they will not understand how we were overwhelmed by numbers but that is not the question colonel the question is is it right to surrender this army if it is right then i will take all the responsibility there had been some correspondence with grant just before the conversation with general pendleton after gordon's attack failed a flag of truce was sent out and about eleven o'clock general lee went to meet general grant the terms of surrender were agreed upon and then general lee called attention to the pressing needs of his men he said i have a thousand or more of your men and officers whom we have required to march along with us for several days i shall be glad to send them to your lines as soon as it can be arranged for i have no provisions for them my own men have been living for the last few days principally upon parched corn and we are badly in need of both rations and forage grant said he would at once send him twenty five thousand rations general lee told him that amount would be ample and would be a great relief he then rode back to his troops the rations issued then to our army were the supplies destined for us but captured at amelia court house had they reached us in time they would have given the half-starved troops that were left strength enough to make a further struggle general long graphically pictures the last scenes it is impossible to describe the anguish of the troops when it was known that the surrender of the army was inevitable of all their trials this was the greatest and hardest to endure there was no consciousness of shame each heart could boast with honest pride that its duty had been done to the end and that still unsullied remained its honor when after his interview with general grant general lee again appeared a shout of welcome instinctively went up from the army but instantly recollecting the sad occasion that brought him before them their shouts sank into silence every hat was raised and the bronze faces of thousands of grim warriors were bathed in tears as he rode slowly along the lines hundreds of his devoted veterans pressed around the noble chief trying to take his hand touch his person or even lay their hands upon his horse thus exhibiting for him their real affection the general then with head bare and tears flowing freely down his manly cheeks bade adieu to the army in a few words men we have fought through the war together i have done my best for you my heart is too full to say more he bade them good-bye and told them to return to their homes and become good citizens the next day he issued his farewell address the last order published to the army headquarters army of northern virginia april tenth eighteen sixty five after four years of arduous service marked by unsurpassed courage and fortitude the army of northern virginia has been compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources i need not tell the survivors of so many hard-fought battles who have remained steadfast to the last that i have consented to this result from no distrust of them but feeling that valor and devotion could accomplish nothing that could compensate for the loss that would have attended the continuation of the contest i have determined to avoid the useless sacrifice of those whose past services have endeared them to their countrymen by the terms of the agreement officers and men can return to their homes and remain there until exchanged you will take with you the satisfaction that proceeds from the consciousness of duty faithfully performed and i earnestly pray that a merciful god will extend to you his blessing and protection with an increasing admiration of your constancy and devotion to your country and a grateful remembrance of your kind and generous consideration of myself i bid you an affectionate farewell r e lee general general long says that general meade called on general lee on the tenth and in the course of conversation remarked 
now that the war may be considered over i hope you will not deem it improper for me to ask for my personal information the strength of your army during the operations about richmond and petersburg general lee replied at no time did my force exceed thirty five thousand men often it was less with a look of surprise meade answered general you amaze me we always estimated your force at about seventy thousand men general de chanel a french officer who was present states that general lee who had been an associate of meade's in the engineers in the old army said to him pleasantly meade years are telling on you your hair is getting quite gray ah general lee was meade's prompt reply it is not the work of years you are responsible for my gray hairs three days after the surrender says long the army of northern virginia had dispersed in every direction and three weeks later the veterans of a hundred battles had exchanged the musket and the sword for the implements of husbandry it is worthy of remark that never before was there an army disbanded with less disorder thousands of soldiers were set adrift in the world without a penny in their pockets to enable them to reach their homes yet none of the scenes of riot that often follow the disbanding of armies marked their course a day or two after the surrender general lee started for richmond riding traveller who had carried him so well all through the war he was accompanied by some of his staff on the way he stopped at the house of his eldest brother charles carter lee who lived on the upper james in powhatan county he spent the evening in talking with his brother but when bedtime came though begged by his host to take the room and bed prepared for him he insisted on going to his old tent pitched by the roadside and passed the night in the quarters that he was accustomed to on april fifteenth he arrived in richmond the people there soon recognized him men women and children crowded around him cheering and waving hats and handkerchiefs it was more like the welcome to a conqueror than to a defeated prisoner on parole he raised his hat in response to their greetings and rode quietly to his home on franklin street where my mother and sisters were anxiously awaiting him thus he returned to that private family life for which he had always longed and became what he always desired to be a peaceful citizen in a peaceful land in attempting to describe these last days of the army of northern virginia i have quoted largely from long jones taylor and fitz lee all of whom have given more or less full accounts of the movements of both armies it so happened that shortly after we left our lines april second or third in one of the innumerable contests my horse was shot and in getting him and myself off the field having no choice of routes the pursuing federal cavalry intervened between me and the rest of our command so i had to make my way around the head of sheridan's advance squadrons before i could rejoin our forces this i did not succeed in accomplishing until april the ninth the day of the surrender for my wounded horse had to be left with a farmer who kindly gave me one of his own in exchange saying i could send him back when i was able or if i was prevented that i could keep him and he would replace him with mine when he got well as i was riding toward appomattox on the ninth i met a body of our cavalry with general t h rosser at the head he told me that general lee and his army had surrendered and that this force had made its way out and was marching back to lynchburg expecting thence to reach general johnston's army to say that i was surprised does not express my feelings i had never heard the word surrender mentioned nor even suggested in connection with our general or our army i could not believe it and did not until i was positively assured by all my friends who were with rosser's column that it was absolutely so very sadly i turned back and went to lynchburg along with them there i found some wagons from our headquarters which had been sent back and with them the horses and servants of the staff these i got together not believing for an instant that our struggle was over and with several officers from our command and others we made our way to greensboro north carolina there i found mr davis and his cabinet and representatives of the confederate departments from richmond there was a great diversity of opinions amongst all present as to what we should do 
after waiting a couple of days looking over the situation from every point of view consulting with my uncle commodore s s lee of the confederate navy and with many others old friends of my father and staunch adherents of the southern cause it was determined to go back to virginia to get our paroles go home and go to work while at greensboro i went to see president davis just before he proceeded on his way farther south he was calm and dignified and in his conversation with several officers of rank who were there seemed to think and so expressed himself that our cause was not lost though sorely stricken and that we could rally our forces west of the mississippi and make good our fight while i was in the room mr davis received the first official communication from general lee of his surrender colonel john taylor wood his aide-de-camp had taken me in to see the president and he and i were standing by him when the dispatch from general lee was brought to him upon reading it he handed it without comment to us then turning away he silently wept bitter tears he seemed quite broken at the moment by this tangible evidence of the loss of his army and the misfortune of its general all of us respecting his great grief silently withdrew leaving him with colonel wood i never saw him again i started for richmond accompanied by several companions with the servants and horses belonging to our headquarters these i had brought down with me from lynchburg where i had found them after the surrender after two weeks of marching and resting i arrived in richmond and found my father there in the house on franklin street now the rooms of the virginia historical society and also my mother brother and sisters they were all much relieved at my reappearance as well as i can recall my father at this time he appeared to be very well physically though he looked older grayer more quiet and reserved he seemed very tired and was always glad to talk of any other subject than that of the war or anything pertaining thereto we all tried to cheer and help him and the people of richmond and of the entire south were as kind and considerate as it was possible to be indeed i think their great kindness tired him he appreciated it all was courteous grateful and polite but he had been under such a terrible strain for several years that he needed the time and quiet to get back his strength of heart and mind all sorts and conditions of people came to see him officers and soldiers from both armies statesmen politicians ministers of the gospel mothers and wives to ask about husbands and sons of whom they had heard nothing to keep him from being overtaxed by this incessant stream of visitors we formed a sort of guard of the young men in the house some of whom took it by turns to keep the door and if possible turn strangers away my father was gentle kind and polite to all and never willingly so far as i know refused to see any one dan lee late of the confederate states navy my first cousin and myself one day had charge of the front door when at it appeared a federal soldier accompanied by a darkey carrying a large willow basket filled to the brim with provisions of every kind the man was irish all over and showed by his uniform and carriage that he was a regular and not a volunteer on our asking him what he wanted he replied that he wanted to see general lee that he had heard down the street the general and his family were suffering for lack of something to eat that he had been with the colonel when he commanded the second cavalry and as long as he had a cent his old colonel should not suffer my father who had stepped into another room as he heard the bell ring hearing something of the conversation came out into the hall the old irishman as soon as he saw him drew himself up and saluted and repeated to the general with tears streaming down his cheeks what he had just said to us my father was very much touched thanked him heartily for his kindness and generosity but told him that he did not need the things he had brought and could not take them this seemed to disappoint the old soldier greatly and he pleaded so hard to be allowed to present the supplies to his old colonel whom he believed to be in want of them that at last my father said that he would accept the basket and send it to the hospital for the sick and wounded who were really in great need though he was not satisfied he submitted to this compromise and then to our surprise and dismay in bidding the general good-bye threw his arms around him and was attempting to kiss him when dan and i interfered 
as he was leaving he said good-bye colonel god bless ye if i could have got over in time i would have been with ye a day or two after that when dan was doorkeeper three federal officers a colonel a major and a doctor called and asked to see general lee they were shown into the parlor presented their cards and said they desired to pay their respects as officers of the united states army when dan went out with the three cards he was told by some one that my father was upstairs engaged with some other visitor so he returned and told them this and they departed when my father came down was shown the cards and told of the three visitors he was quite put out at dan's not having brought him the cards at the time and that afternoon mounted him on one of his horses and sent him over to manchester where they were camped to look up the three officers and to tell them he would be glad to see them at any time they might be pleased to call however dan failed to find them he had another visit at this time which affected him deeply two confederate soldiers in very dilapidated clothing worn and emaciated in body came to see him they said they had been selected from about sixty other fellows too ragged to come themselves to offer him a home in the mountains of virginia the home was a good house and farm and near by was a defile in some rugged hills from which they could defy the entire federal army they made this offer of a home and their protection because there was a report that he was about to be indicted for treason the general had to decline to go with them but the tears came into his eyes at this hearty exhibition of loyalty after being in richmond a few days and by the advice of my father getting my parole from the united states provost marshal there the question as to what i should do came up my father told me that i could go back to college if i desired and prepare myself for some profession that he had a little money which he would be willing and glad to devote to the completion of my education i think he was strongly in favour of my going back to college at the same time he told me that if i preferred it i could take possession of my farmland in king william county which i had inherited from my grandfather mr custis and make my home there as there was little left of the farm but the land he thought he could arrange to help me build a house and purchase stock and machinery my brother general w h f lee had already gone back to his place the white house in new kent county with major john lee our first cousin had erected a shanty and gone to work breaking up land for a corn crop putting their cavalry horses to the plough as i thought my father had use for any means he might have in caring for my mother and sister and as i had this property i determined to become a farmer however i did not decide positively and in the meantime it was thought best that i should join my brother and cousin at the white house and help them make their crop of corn in returning to richmond i had left at hickory hill general wickham's place in hanover county our horses and servants taken with me from lynchburg to greensboro and back so bidding all my friends and family good-bye i went by rail to hickory hill and started the next day with three servants and about eight horses for new kent stopping the first night at pompatiki the next day i reached the white house where the reinforcements i brought with me were hailed with delight though i've been a farmer from that day to this i will say that the crop of corn which we planted that summer with ourselves and army servants as labourers and our old cavalry horses as teams and which we did not finish planting until the ninth of june was the best i ever made End of chapter eight chapter nine of recollections and letters of general robert e lee by robert e lee jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine a private citizen lee's conception of the part his influence exerted toward the restoration of virginia he visits old friends throughout the country receives offers of positions compares notes with the union general hunter longs for a country home finds one at derwent near cartersville my father remained quietly in richmond with my mother and sisters he was now a private citizen for the first time in his life as he had always been a good soldier so now he became a good citizen 
my father's advice to all his old officers and men was to submit to the authority of the land and to stay at home now that their native states needed them more than ever his advice and example had great influence with all in a letter to colonel walter taylor footnote his old a a g end note he speaks on this point i am sorry to hear that our returned soldiers cannot obtain employment tell them they must all set to work and if they cannot do what they prefer do what they can virginia wants all their aid all their support and the presence of all her sons to sustain and recuperate her they must therefore put themselves in a position to take part in her government and not be deterred by obstacles in their way there is much to be done which they only can do and in a letter a month later to an officer asking his opinion about a decree of the emperor of mexico encouraging the immigration from the south to that country i do not know how far their immigration to another land will conduce to their prosperity although prospects may not now be cheering i have entertained the opinion that unless prevented by circumstances or necessity it would be better for them and the country if they remained at their homes and shared the fate of their respective states again in a letter to governor letcher footnote the war governor of virginia end note the duty of its citizens then appears to me too plain to admit of doubt all should unite in honest efforts to obliterate the effects of the war and to restore the blessings of peace they should remain if possible in the country promote harmony and good feeling qualify themselves to vote and elect to the state and general legislatures wise and patriotic men who will devote their abilities to the interests of the country and the healing of all dissensions i have invariably recommended this course since the cessation of hostilities and have endeavoured to practise it myself also in a letter of still later date to captain josiah tatnall of the confederate states navy he thus emphasises the same sentiment i believe it to be the duty of every one to unite in the restoration of the country and the re-establishment of peace and harmony these considerations governed me in the counsels i gave to others and induced me on the thirteenth of june to make application to be included in the terms of the amnesty proclamation these letters and many more show plainly his conception of what was right for all to do at this time i have heard him repeatedly give similar advice to relatives and friends and to strangers who sought it the following letters to general grant and to president johnson show how he gave to the people of the south an example of quiet submission to the government of the country richmond virginia june thirteenth eighteen sixty five lieutenant-general u s grant commanding the armies of the united states general upon reading the president's proclamation of the twenty ninth ult i came to richmond to ascertain what was proper or required of me to do when i learned that with others i was to be indicted for treason by the grand jury at norfolk i had supposed that the officers and men of the army of northern virginia were by the terms of their surrender protected by the united states government from molestation so long as they conformed to its conditions i am ready to meet any charges that may be preferred against me and do not wish to avoid trial but if i am correct as to the protection granted by my parole and am not to be prosecuted i desire to comply with the provisions of the president's proclamation and therefore enclose the required application which i request in that event may be acted on i am with great respect your obedient servant r e lee richmond virginia june thirteenth eighteen sixty five his excellency andrew johnson president of the united states sir being excluded from the provisions of the amnesty and pardon contained in the proclamation of the twenty ninth ult i hereby apply for the benefits and full restoration of all rights and privileges extended to those included in its terms i graduated at the military academy at west point in june eighteen twenty nine resigned from the united states army april eighteen sixty one was a general in the confederate army and included in the surrender of the army of northern virginia april nine eighteen sixty five i have the honor to be very respectfully your obedient servant r e lee of this latter letter my brother custis lee writes me when general lee requested me to make a copy of this letter 
he remarked it was but right for him to set an example of making formal submission to the civil authorities and that he thought by so doing he might possibly be in a better position to be of use to the confederates who were not protected by military paroles especially mr davis colonel charles marshall says footnote a grandson of chief justice marshall and lee's military secretary end note he general lee set to work to use his great influence to reconcile the people of the south to the hard consequences of their defeat to inspire them with hope to lead them to accept freely and frankly the government that had been established by the result of the war and thus relieve them from the military rule the advice and example of general lee did more to incline the scale in favor of a frank and manly adoption of that course of conduct which tended to the restoration of peace and harmony than all the federal garrisons in all the military districts my father was at this time anxious to secure for himself and family a house somewhere in the country he had always had a desire to be the owner of a small farm where he could end his days in peace and quiet the life in richmond was not suited to him he wanted quiet and rest but could not get it there for people were too attentive to him so in the first days of june he mounted old traveller and unattended rode down to pampatike some twenty-five miles to pay a visit of several days to his relations there this is an old carter property belonging then and now to colonel thomas h carter who but lately returned from appomattox courthouse was living there with his wife and children colonel carter whose father was a first cousin of general lee's entered the army of northern virginia in the spring of eighteen sixty one as captain of the king william battery rose grade by grade by his skill and gallantry and surrendered in the spring of eighteen sixty five as colonel and chief of artillery of his corps at that time he was highly esteemed and much beloved by my father and our families had been intimate for a long time pompatike is a large old-fashioned plantation lying along the pamunkey river between the piping tree and newcastle ferries part of the house is very old and from time to time as more rooms were needed additions have been made giving the whole a very quaint and picturesque appearance at the old-fashioned dinner hour of three o'clock my father mounted on traveller unannounced unexpected and alone rode up to the door the horse and rider were at once recognized by colonel carter and he was gladly welcomed by his kinsfolk i am sure the days passed here were the happiest he had spent for many years he was very weary of town of the incessant unrest incident to his position of the crowds of persons of all sorts and conditions striving to see him so one can imagine the joy of master and horse when after a hot ride of over twenty miles they reached this quiet place my father colonel carter tells me enjoyed every moment of his stay there were three children in the house the two youngest little girls of five and three years old these were his special delight and he followed them around talking baby talk to them and getting them to talk to him every morning before he was up they went into his room at his special request to pay him a visit another great pleasure was to watch traveller enjoy himself he had him turned out on the lawn where the june grass was very fine abundant and at its prime and would allow no corn to be fed to him saying he had had plenty of that during the last four years and that the grass and the liberty were what he needed he talked to colonel carter much about mexico its people and climate also about the old families living in that neighborhood and elsewhere in the state with whom both colonel carter and himself were connected but he said very little about the recent war and only in answer to some direct question about six miles from pompatike on the same river and close to its banks is cherokoke another old virginia homestead which had belonged to the braxtons for generations and at that time was the home of corbin braxton's widow general lee was invited to dine there and to meet him my brother cousin and i from the white house were asked besides general rosser who was staying in the neighborhood and several others 
this old virginia house had long been noted for its lavish hospitality and bountiful table mrs braxton had never realized that the war should make any change in this respect and her table was still spread in those days of desolation as it had been before the war when there was plenty in the land so we sat down to a repast composed of all the good things for which that country was famous john and i did not seem to think there was too much in sight at any rate it did not daunt us and we did our best to lessen the quantity consuming i think our share and more we had been for so many years in the habit of being hungry that it was not strange we continued to be so a while yet but my father took a different view of the abundance displayed and during his drive back said to colonel carter thomas there was enough dinner to-day for twenty people all this will now have to be changed you cannot afford it we shall have to practice economy in talking with colonel carter about the situation of farmers at that time in the south and of their prospects for the future he urged him to get rid of the negroes left on the farm some ninety odd in number principally women and children with a few old men saying the government would provide for them and advised him to secure white labor the colonel told him he had to use for immediate needs such force as he had being unable at that time to get the whites whereupon general lee remarked i have always observed that wherever you find the negro everything is going down around him and wherever you find the white man you see everything around him improving he was thinking strongly of taking a house in the country for himself and family and asked the colonel whether he could not suggest some part of the state that might suit him colonel carter mentioned clark county as representing the natural grass section of virginia and gloucester county the salt water my father unhesitatingly pronounced in favor of the grass-growing country he told mrs carter how pleased he was to hear that she had received her husband in tears when he returned from the surrender as showing the true spirit for though glad to see him she wept because he could fight no more for the cause the day after this dinner he had to turn his back on these dear friends and their sweet home when traveller was brought up to the door for him to mount he walked all around him looking carefully at the horse saddle and bridle apparently the blanket was not arranged to suit him for he held the bridle while uncle henry took off the saddle then he took off the blanket himself spread it on the grass and folding it to suit his own ideas of fitness carefully placed it on traveller's back and superintended closely the putting on and girthing of the saddle this being done he bade everybody good-bye and mounting his horse rode away homeward to richmond after crossing the pamaki at newcastle ferry he rode into ingleside about a mile from the river the lovely home of mrs mary braxton here he dismounted and paid his respects to the mistress of the house and her daughters who were also cousins that afternoon he reached richmond returning by the same road he had travelled coming out after this visit which he had enjoyed so much he began looking about more than ever to find a country home the house he was occupying in richmond belonged to mr john stuart of brook hill who was noted for his devotion to the cause of the south and his kindness to all those who had suffered in the conflict my brother custis had rented it at the time he was appointed on mr davis's staff a mess had been established there by my brother and several other officers on duty in richmond in time my mother and sister had been made members of it and it had been the headquarters of all the family during the war when in town my father was desirous of making some settlement with his landlord for its long use but before he could take the final steps my mother received the following note from mr stuart i am not presuming on your good opinion when i feel that you will believe me first that you and yours are heartily welcome to the house as long as your convenience leads you to stay in richmond and next that you owe me nothing but if you insist on paying that payment must be in confederate currency for which alone it was rented to your son you do not know how much gratification it is and will afford me and my whole family during the remainder of our lives to reflect that we have been brought into contact and to know and to appreciate you and all that are dear to you my father had been offered since the surrender houses lands and money as well as positions as president of business associations and chartered corporations 
an english nobleman long says desired him to accept a mansion and an estate commensurate with his individual merits and the greatness of an historic family he replied i am deeply grateful i cannot desert my native state in the hour of her adversity i must abide her fortunes and share her fate until his death he was constantly in receipt of such offers all of which he thought proper to decline he wrote to general long i am looking for some little quiet home in the woods where i can procure shelter and my daily bread if permitted by the victor i wish to get mrs lee out of the city as soon as practical it so happened that nearly exactly what he was looking for was just then offered to him mrs elizabeth randolph cock of cumberland county a granddaughter of edmund randolph had on her estate a small cottage which with the land attached she placed at his disposal the retired situation of this little home and the cordial way in which mrs cock insisted on his coming induced my father to accept her invitation captain edmund randolph cock footnote mrs cock's second son who lived with his mother at oakland end note, writes me the following oakland virginia october twenty five eighteen ninety six my mother whose sympathies for everybody and everything connected with our cause were the greatest and most enlarged of any one i ever knew thought it might be agreeable and acceptable to general lee to have a retired place in which to rest having this little house unoccupied she invited him to accept it as a home as long as he might find it pleasant to himself the general came up with your mother and sisters about the last of june general custis lee having preceded them a day or two on traveller at that time our mode of travel was on the canal by horse packet leaving richmond at a little before sunset the boat reached pemberton our landing about sunrise general custis and i went down to meet them and we all reached home in time for breakfast that night on the boat the captain had had the most comfortable bed put up that he could command which was offered to your father but he preferred to sleep on deck which he did with his military cloak thrown over him no doubt that was the last night he ever spent under the open sky after a week spent there general lee removed with his family to derwent there he spent several months of quiet and rest only interrupted by the calls of those who came in all honesty and sincerity to pay their respects to him old soldiers citizens men and women all came without parade or ceremony during this time he rode on traveller daily taking sometimes long trips once i recall going to his brother's mr carter lee's about twenty miles and at another time to bremo about thirty miles during the month of august he was visited by judge brockenborough of lexington who as rector of the board of trustees of washington college tendered him on behalf of the board the presidency of the college after considering the matter for several weeks he decided to accept this position during that summer he was a regular attendant at the various churches in our neighborhood whenever there was service i never heard your father discuss public matters at all nor did he express his opinion of public men on one occasion i did hear him condemn with great severity the secretary of war stanton this was at the time mrs surratt was condemned and executed at another time i heard him speak harshly of general hunter who had written to him to get his approval of his movements during the valley campaign against general early with these exceptions i never heard him speak of public men or measures in this connection i quote the rev j william jones in his personal reminiscences of general robert e lee not long after the close of the war general lee received a letter from general david hunter of the federal army in which he begged information on two points one his hunter's campaign in the summer of eighteen sixty four was undertaken on information received at the war department in washington that general lee was about to detach forty thousand picked troops to send general johnston did not his hunter's movements prevent this and relieve sherman to that extent two when he hunter found it necessary to retreat from before lynchburg did not he adopt the most feasible line of retreat general lee wrote a very courteous reply in which he said 
the information upon which your campaign was undertaken was erroneous i had no troops to spare general johnston and no intention of sending him any certainly not forty thousand as that would have taken about all i had as to the second point i would say that i am not advised as to the motives which induced you to adopt the line of retreat which you took and am not perhaps competent to judge of the question but i certainly expected you to retreat by way of the shenandoah valley footnote the italics are dr jones's End note. and was gratified at the time that you preferred the route through the mountains to the ohio leaving the valley open for general early's advance into maryland before leaving richmond my father wrote the following letter to colonel ordway then provost marshal richmond virginia june twenty one eighteen sixty five lieutenant colonel albert ordway provost marshal department of virginia colonel i propose establishing my family next week in cumberland county virginia near cartersville on the james river canal on announcing my intention to general patrick when he was on duty in richmond he stated that no passport for the purpose was necessary should there have been any change in the orders of the department rendering passports necessary i request that i may be furnished with them my son g w custis lee a paroled prisoner with myself will accompany me very respectfully your obedient servant r e lee the latter part of june my father mother brother custis and sisters went to derwent the name of the little place which was to be his home for that summer they went by canal boat from richmond to cartersville and then had a drive of about six miles mrs cock lived at oakland two miles away and her generous heart was made glad by the opportunity of supplying my father and his family with every comfort that it was possible to get at that time in his letters to me still at the white house busy with our corn he gives a description of his surroundings we are all well and established in a comfortable but small house in a grove of oaks belonging to mrs thomas cock footnote mrs cock's eldest son end note it contains four rooms and there is a house in the yard which when fitted up will give us another only your mother agnes and mildred are with me custis who has had a return of his attack is at mrs cock's house about two miles off is convalescent i hope i have been nowhere as yet the weather has been excessively hot but this morning there is an agreeable change with some rain the country here is poor but healthy and we are at a long distance from you all i can do nothing until i learn what decision in my case is made in washington all unite with me in much love very truly your father r e lee the case referred to here was the indictment in june by a grand jury in norfolk virginia of mr davis general lee and others for treason or something like it the hon reverdy johnson offered his professional services to my father in this case but there was no trial as a letter from general grant to the authorities insisted that the parole given by him to the officers and soldiers of the army of northern virginia should be respected the following letter explains itself near cartersville virginia july twenty seventh eighteen sixty five hon reverdy johnson baltimore maryland my dear sir i very much regret that i did not see you on your recent visit to richmond that i might have thanked you for the interest you have shown in my behalf and your great kindness in offering me your professional services in the indictment which i now understand is pending against me i am very glad however that you had an opportunity of reading a copy of general grant's letter of the twentieth instant to me which i left with mr mcfarland for that purpose and also that he might show it to other officers of the army of northern virginia in my condition i did not wish to give it greater publicity without the assent of general grant supposing that if he desired it made public he would take steps to have it done should he consent to your request to have it published i of course have no objection but should he not i request that you only use it in the manner i have above indicated again offering you my warmest thanks for your sympathy and consideration for my welfare i am with great respect your obedient servant r e lee 
in another letter to me he tells of his visit to his brother charles carter lee in powhatan county which was an easy ride from derwent he was very fond of making these little excursions and traveller that summer was in constant use near cartersville july twenty second eighteen sixty five my dear rob i have just returned from a visit to your uncle carter and among my letters find one from some of your comrades to you which i enclose i was happy to discover from the direction that it was intended for you and not for me i find agnes quite sick and have sent for the doctor as i do not know what to do for her poor little thing she seems quite prostrated custis i am told is better he is still at mrs cox the rest of us are well i saw several of your comrades cox kennons and gilliams who inquired after you all give my love to f and johnny in which all here unite and believe me most truly and affectionately your father r e lee robert e lee in another letter he gives an account of a trip that he and traveller had taken across the river into albemarle county near cartersville august twenty one eighteen sixty five my dear bertus i received only a few days ago your letter of the twelfth i am very sorry to hear of your afflictions but hope you have shaken off all of them you must keep your eyes open you precious boy and not run against noxious vines and fevers i have just returned from a visit to fluvanna i rode up the grey and extended my peregrinations into albemarle but no further than the green mountain neighbourhood i made short rides stopping every evening with some friend and had a very pleasant time i commend you to all the young ladies on the road but did not know i was extolling a poisoned bow you must go up and see miss francis galt tell fitzhugh i wrote to him before i went away i am glad to hear that your corn is so fine and that you are making preparations to put in a good crop of wheat i wish i had a little farm somewhere to be at work too custis is paying a visit to his friend captain watkins in powhatan he came up for him last saturday and bore him off he has got quite well now and i hope will continue so agnes is also again well though still feeble and thin your mother life and myself as usual we have not heard for some time from daughter a report has reached us of her being at mr burwell's miss mary cock and her brother john paid us a short visit from saturday to monday and several of our neighbours have been over to spend the day we have a quiet time which is delightful to me but i fear not so exhilarating to the girls i missed uncle carter's visit he and his robert rode up on a pair of colts while i was in fluvanna and spent several days i wish we were nearer you boys i want to see you very much but do not know when that can be i hope johnny is well i have heard nothing from his father since we parted in richmond but hear that fitz has gone to see his mother all here send their best love to you and i pray that every happiness may attend you your devoted father r e lee robert e lee bertus was a contraction of robertus my father's pet name for me as a child my afflictions were poison oak chills and fever the letter to my brother fitzhugh here referred to i also give near cartersville cumberland county virginia july twenty nine eighteen sixty five my dear fitzhugh i was very glad to receive by the last packet from richmond your letter of the twenty second we had all been quite anxious to hear from you and were much gratified to learn that you were all well and doing well it is very cheering to me to hear of your good prospects for corn and your cheerful prospects for the future god grant they may be realized which i am sure they will be if you will unite sound judgment to your usual energy in your operations as to the indictments i hope you at least may not be prosecuted i see no other reason for it than for prosecuting all who ever engaged in the war i think however we may expect procrastination in measures of relief denunciatory threats etc we must be patient and let them take their course as soon as i can ascertain their intention toward me if not prevented i shall endeavour to procure some humble but quiet abode for your mother and sisters where i hope they can be happy as i before said i want to get in some grass country where the natural product of the land will do much for my subsistence 
our neighbours are very kind and do everything in the world to promote our comfort if agnes is well enough i propose to ride up to bremo next week i wish i was near enough to see you give much love to rob and johnny the carters and braxtons all here unite in love and best wishes for you all most affectionately your father r e lee End of a chapter nine chapter ten of recollections and letters of general robert e lee by robert e lee jr this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten president of washington college patriotic motives for acceptance of trust condition of college the general's arrival at lexington he prepares for the removal of his family to that city advice to robert jr trip to bremo on a private canal boat mrs lee's invalidism about this time my father received from the board of trustees of washington college a notification of his election to the presidency of that institution at a meeting of the board held in lexington virginia on august four eighteen sixty five the letter apprising him of the action was presented by judge john w brockenborough rector of the college this was a complete surprise to my father he had already been offered the vice-chancellorship of the university of the south at sewanee tennessee but declined it on the ground that it was denominational and to some suggestions that he should connect himself with the university of virginia he objected because it was a state institution washington college had started as an academy in seventeen forty nine it was the first classical school opened in the valley of virginia after a struggle of many years under a succession of principals and with several changes of site it at length acquired such a reputation as to attract the attention of general washington he gave it a handsome endowment and the institution changed its name from liberty hall academy to washington college in the summer of eighteen sixty five the college through the calamities of civil war had reached the lowest point of depression it had ever known its buildings library and apparatus had suffered from the sack and plunder of hostile soldiery its invested funds owing to the general impoverishment throughout the land were for the first time being rendered unproductive and their ultimate value was most uncertain four professors still remained on duty and there were about forty students mainly from the country around lexington it was not a state institution nor confined to any one religious denomination so two objections which might have been made by my father were removed but the college in later years had only a local reputation it was very poor indifferently equipped with buildings and with no means in sight to improve its conditions there was a general expectation that he would decline the position as not sufficiently lucrative if his purpose was to repair the ruins of his private fortune resulting from the war as not lifting him conspicuously enough in the public gaze if he was ambitious of office or further distinction or as involving too great labor and anxiety if he coveted repose after the terrible contest from which he had just emerged Footnote professor e s joins in note he was very reluctant to accept this appointment but for none of the above reasons as the average man might have been why he was doubtful of undertaking the responsibilities of such a position his letter of acceptance clearly shows he considered the matter carefully and then wrote the following letter to the committee powhatan county august twenty four eighteen sixty five gentlemen i have delayed for some days replying to your letter of the fifth instant informing me of my election by the board of trustees to the presidency of washington college from a desire to give the subject due consideration fully impressed with the responsibilities of the office i have feared that i should be unable to discharge its duties to the satisfaction of the trustees or to the benefit of the country the proper education of youth requires not only great ability but i fear more strength than i now possess for i do not feel able to undergo the labor of conducting classes in regular courses of instruction i could not therefore undertake more than the general administration and supervision of the institution there is another subject which has caused me serious reflection and is i think worthy of the consideration of the board 
being excluded from the terms of amnesty in the proclamation of the president of the united states of the twenty ninth of may last and an object of censure to the portion of the country i have thought it probable that my occupation of the position of president might draw upon the college a feeling of hostility and i should therefore cause injury to an institution which it would be my highest desire to advance i think it the duty of every citizen in the present condition of the country to do all in his power to aid in the restoration of peace and harmony and in no way to oppose the policy of the state or general government directed to that object it is particularly incumbent on those charged with the instruction of the young to set them an example of submission to authority and i could not consent to be the cause of animadversion upon the college should you however take a different view and think that my services in the position tendered to me by the board will be advantageous to the college and country i will yield to your judgment and accept it otherwise i must most respectfully decline the office begging you to express to the trustees of the college my heartfelt gratitude for the honour conferred upon me and requesting you to accept my cordial thanks for the kind manner in which you have communicated their decision i am gentlemen with great respect your most obedient servant r e lee to present a clearer view of some of the motives influencing my father in accepting this trust for such he considered it i give an extract from an address on the occasion of his death by bishop wilmer of louisiana delivered at the university of the south at sewanee tennessee i was seated says bishop wilmer at the close of the day in my virginia home when i beheld through the thickening shades of evening a horseman entering the yard whom i soon recognized as general lee the next morning he placed in my hands the correspondence with the authorities of washington college at lexington he had been invited to become president of that institution i confess to a momentary feeling of chagrin at the proposed change shall i say revulsion in his history the institution was one of local interest and comparatively unknown to our people i named others more conspicuous which would welcome him with ardour as their presiding head i soon discovered that his mind towered above these earthly distinctions that in his judgment the cause gave dignity to the institution and not the wealth of its endowment or the renown of its scholars that this door and not another was open to him by providence and he only wished to be assured of his competency to fulfil his trust and thus to make his few remaining years a comfort and blessing to his suffering country i had spoken to his human feelings he had now revealed himself to me as one whose life was hid with christ in god my speech was no longer restrained i congratulated him that his heart was inclined to this great cause and that he was spared to give to the world this august testimony to the importance of christian education how he listened to my feeble words how he beckoned me to his side as the fullness of heart found utterance how his whole countenance glowed with animation as i spoke of the holy ghost as the great teacher whose presence was required to make education a blessing which otherwise might be the curse of mankind how feelingly he responded how eloquently as i never heard him speak before can never be effaced from memory and nothing more sacred mingles with my reminiscences of the dead the board of trustees on august thirty first adopted and sent to general lee resolutions saying that in spite of his objections his connection with the institution would greatly promote its prosperity and advance the general interest of education and urged him to enter upon his duties as president at his earliest convenience my father had had nearly four years experience in the charge of young men at west point the conditions at that place to be sure were very different from those at the one to which he was now going but the work in the main was the same to train improve and elevate 
i think he was influenced in making up his mind to accept this position by the great need of education in his state and in the south and by the opportunity that he saw at washington college for starting almost from the beginning and for helping by his experience and example the youth of his country to become good and useful citizens in the latter part of september he mounted traveller and started alone for lexington he was four days on the journey stopping with some friend each night he rode into lexington on the afternoon of the fourth day no one knowing of his coming until he quietly drew up and dismounted at the village inn professor white who had just turned into the main street as the general halted in front of the hotel said he knew in a moment that this stately rider on the iron gray charger must be general lee he therefore at once went forward as two or three old soldiers gathered around to help the general down and insisted on taking him to the home of colonel reed the professor's father-in-law where he had already been invited to stay my father with his usual consideration for others as it was late in the afternoon had determined to remain at the hotel that night and go to mr reed's in the morning but yielding to captain white's he always called him captain his confederate title assurances that all was ready for him he accompanied him to the home of his kind host the next morning before breakfast he wrote the following letter to my mother announcing his safe arrival the captain edmund and mr preston mentioned in it were the sons of our revered friend and benefactress mrs e r cock colonel preston and captain frank were her brother and nephew lexington september nineteenth eighteen sixty five my dear mary i reached here yesterday about one p m and on riding up to the hotel was met by professor white of washington college who brought me up to his father-in-law's colonel reed the oldest member of the trustees of the college where i am very comfortably quartered to-day i will look out for accommodations elsewhere as the colonel has a large family and i fear i am intruding upon his hospitality i have not yet visited the college grounds they seem to be beautifully located and the buildings are undergoing repairs the house assigned to the president i am told has been rented to dr madison i believe who has not been able to procure another residence and i do not know when it will be vacated nor can i tell you more about it i saw mrs cock yesterday afternoon who looks remarkably well and will return to the alum springs to-morrow captain edmund is with her and goes to-day to kentucky he and mr preston are very well the latter will accompany his mother to the alum i have not yet seen him i saw mrs and colonel preston captain frank and his sister all the family are well i shall go after breakfast to inquire after my trunks i had a very pleasant journey here the first two days were very hot but reaching the mountain region the third day the temperature was much cooler i came up in four days easy rides getting to my stopping place by one p m each day except the third when i slept on top of the blue ridge which i reached at three p m the scenery was beautiful all the way i am riding before breakfast and must be short last night i found a blanket and coverlet rather light covering and this morning i see a fire in the dining-room i have thought much of you all since i left give much love to the girls and custis and remember me to all in oakland most affectionately yours r e lee mrs r e lee when he first arrived the family very naturally stood a little in awe of him this feeling however was soon dispelled for his simple and unaffected manners in a short while put them at ease there were some little children in the house and they and the general at once became great friends with these kind and hospitable friends he stayed several days after being present at a meeting of the board of trustees he rode traveller over to the rock bridge baths eleven miles from lexington and from there writes to my mother on september twenty fifth am very glad to hear of rob's arrival i am sorry that i missed seeing the latter but find it was necessary that i should have been present at the meeting of the board of trustees on the twentieth they adjourned on the evening of the twenty first and on the morning of the twenty second i rode over here where i found annie and miss bell 
footnote mrs chapman lee and miss bell harrison of brandon both very dear friends and cousins of my father end note the babies footnote mrs lee's end note are well and sweet i have taken the baths every day since my arrival and like them very much in fact they are delightful and i wish you were all here to enjoy them annie and bell go in two and sometimes three times a day yesterday i procured some horses and took them up to the top of jump mountain where we had one of the most beautiful views i ever saw to-day i could get but one horse and miss bell and i rode up hayes creek valley which possessed beauties of a different kind i shall return to lexington on the twenty ninth i perceive as yet no change in my rheumatic affection tell custis i am much obliged to him for his attention to my baggage all the articles enumerated by him arrived safely at colonel reed's thursday morning early i also received the package of letters he sent i hope he may receive the appointment at the vmi every one interested has expressed a desire he should do so and i am more desirous than all of them if he comes by land he will find the route i took very pleasant and about a hundred and eight miles namely bremo dr wilmers waynesboro greenville he will find me at the lexington hotel i wish you were all with me i feel very solitary and miss you all dreadfully give much love to the girls and boys kind remembrances to mrs p miss louisa and mrs thomas cock i have no news most affectionately r e lee p s annie and bell send a great deal of love to all r e l these little excursions and the meeting with old friends and dear cousins were sources of real enjoyment and grateful rest the pains of the past the worries of the present and the cares for the future were for the time being banished my father earnestly desired a quiet informal inauguration and his wish was gratified on october second eighteen sixty five in the presence of the trustees professors and students after solemn and appropriate prayer by the rev w s white d d the oldest christian minister in the town footnote the father of professor or captain white end note he took the oath of office as required by the laws of the college and was thus legally inaugurated as its president on october third he wrote to my mother i am glad to hear that rob is improving and hope you had the pleasure of seeing mr dana footnote our old pastor of christ church alexandria the trusted friend of my grandmother and mother who had baptized all the children at arlington End note. the college opened yesterday and a fine set of youths about fifty made their appearance in a body it is supposed that many more will be coming during the month the scarcity of money everywhere embarrasses all proceedings general smith informs me that the military institute will commence its exercises on the sixteenth instant and that custis was unanimously elected to the chair of civil engineering footnote the virginia military institute a state institution modeled after the u s military academy at west point was located in lexington and its grounds adjoined those of washington college since its foundation in eighteen thirty nine up to this time general f h smith has been its superintendent End note. i am living at the lexington hotel and he must come there if he comes up the ladies have furnished me a very nice room in the college for my office new carpet from baltimore curtains etc they are always doing something kind and i came up september thirtieth from the baths annie and miss bell still there and very well they expect to be here on the tenth you tell me nothing of the girls i hope agnes is getting strong and fat i wished for them both at the baths annie and bell were my only companions i could not trespass upon them always the scenery is beautiful here but i fear it will be locked up in winter by the time you come nothing could be more beautiful than the mountains now most affectionately r e lee in addition to his duties as college president my father had to make all the arrangements for his new home the house assigned him by the college was occupied by dr madison who was to move out as soon as he could carpenters painters and glaziers had to be put to work to get it into condition 
furniture carpets bedding to be provided a cook procured servants and provisions supplied my mother was an invalid and absent and as my sisters were with her everything down to the minutest detail was done by my father's directions and under his superintendence he had always been noted for his care and attention to little things and that trait apparent in him when a mere lad practised all through his busy and eventful life stood him in good stead now the difficulties to be overcome were made greater by the scarcity and inaccessibility of supplies and workmen and the smallness of his means in addition he conducted a large correspondence always answering every letter to every member of his family he wrote continually and was interested in all our pursuits advising and helping us as no one else could have done some of his letters to my mother at this time show how he looked into every matter great and small which related to her comfort and welfare and to the preparation of her new home for example on october ninth he writes life is indeed gliding away and i have nothing of good to show for mine that is past i pray i may be spared to accomplish something for the benefit of mankind and the honour of god i hope i may be able to get the house prepared for you in time to reach here before the cold weather dr madison has sent me word that he will vacate the house on the sixteenth instant this day week i will commence to make some outside repairs this week so as to get at the inside next and hope by the first of november it will be ready for you there is no furniture belonging to the house but we shall require but little to commence with mr green of alexandria to whom i had written says that his manufacturing machinery etc has been so much injured that although it has been returned to him he cannot resume operations until next year but that he will purchase for us anything we desire i believe nothing is manufactured in richmond everything comes from the north and we might as well write to baltimore at once for what we want what do you think i believe nothing of consequence is manufactured here i will see this week what can be done and again a few days later he writes i hope you are all well and as comfortable as can be i am very anxious to get you all here but have made little progress in accomplishing it so far dr m expects to vacate the house this week but i fear it is not certain he can do so i engaged some carpenters last week to repair the roof fences stable etc but for want of material they could not make a commencement there is no lumber here at hand everything has to be prepared i have not been in the house yet but i hear there is much to be done we shall have to be patient as soon as it is vacated i will set to work i think it will be more expeditious and cheaper to write to renwick of baltimore to send what articles of furniture will be required and also to order some carpets from baltimore in a postscript dated the seventeenth he says the carpenters made a beginning on the house yesterday i hope it may be vacated this week i will prepare your room first the rest of us can bivouac love to all most affectionately r e lee on october nineteenth i have been over the house we are to occupy it is in wretched condition mrs m has not yet vacated it but i have some men at work though this storm has interrupted their operations and i fear little will be done this week i think i can make your room comfortable the upstairs is very convenient and the rest of the house sufficiently so i think you had better write at once to brit footnote the brit mentioned here is mrs britannia kennan of tudor place my mother's first cousin she had saved for us a great many of the household goods from arlington having gotten permission from the federal authorities to do so at the time it was occupied by their forces End note. to send the curtains you speak of and the carpets it is better to use what we have than to buy others their use where originally intended is very uncertain footnote arlington to that beloved home my mother still hoped to return and note they have been tossed about for four years and may be lost or ruined they can come by express to lynchburg and then up the canal or by richmond the merchants say the former is the best way much more expeditious and but little more expensive 
spending the summer on the pamunkey at the white house exposed all day in the fields to the sun and at night to the malaria from the river and marshes i became by the last of september one continuous chill so it was decided that as the corn was made the fodder saved the wheat land broken up and hands not so greatly needed i could get a furlough mounting my mare i started on a visit to my mother and sisters hoping that the change to the upper country would help me to get rid of the malaria when i reached derwent my father had gone to lexington but my mother and the rest were there to welcome me and dose me for my ailments there was still some discussion among us all as to what was the best thing for me to do and i wrote to my father telling him of my preference for a farmer's life and my desire to work my own land the following letter which he wrote me in reply is like all i ever got from him full of love tenderness and good sensible advice my dear son i did not receive until yesterday your letter of the eighth instant i regret very much having missed seeing you still more to hear that you have been suffering from intermittent fever i think the best thing you can do is to eradicate the disease from your system and unless there is some necessity for your returning to the white house you had better accompany your mother here i have thought very earnestly as to your future i do not know to what stage your education has been carried or whether it would be advantageous for you to pursue it further of that you can judge if you do and will apply yourself so as to get the worth of your money i can advance it to you for this year at least if you do not and wish to take possession of your farm i can assist you a little in that as matters now stand you could raise money on your farm only by mortgaging it which would put you in debt at the beginning of your life and i fear in the end would swallow up all your property as soon as i am restored to civil rights if i ever am i will settle up your grandfather's estate and put you in possession of your share the land may be responsible for some portion of his debts or legacies if so you will have to assume it in the meantime i think it would be better for you if you determine to farm your land to go down there as you propose and begin on a moderate scale i can furnish you means to buy a team wagon implements etc what will it cost if you cannot wait to accompany your mother here come up to see me and we can talk it over you could come up in the packet and return again if you do come ask agnes for my box of private papers i left with her and bring it with you but do not lose it for your life or we are all ruined wrap it up with your clothes and put it in a carpet-bag or valise so that you can keep it with you or within your sight and do not call attention to it i am glad to hear that fitzhugh keeps so well and that he is prospering in his farming operations give him a great deal of love for me the first thing you must do is to get well your affectionate father r e lee his letters to his daughters tell in a playful way much of his life and are full of the quiet humour in which he so often indulged we were still at derwent awaiting the time when the house in lexington should be ready it had been decided that i should remain and accompany my mother and sisters to lexington and that some of us or all should go up the river to bremo the beautiful seat of dr charles cock and pay a visit there before proceeding to lexington here is a letter from my father to his daughter mildred lexington october twenty nine eighteen sixty five my precious life your nice letters gave me much pleasure and made me the more anxious to see you i think you girls after your mother is comfortable at bremo will have to come up and arrange the house for her reception you know i am a poor hand and can do nothing without your advice your brother too is wild for the want of admonition colonel blair is now his fidus acates and as he is almost as gray as your papa and wears the same uniform all gray he is sometimes taken for him by the young girls who consider your brother the most attentive of sons and giving good promise of making a desirable husband he will find himself married some of these days before he knows it you had better be near him i hope you give attention to robert miss sally will thaw some of the ice from his heart tell her she must come up here as i want to see her badly i do not know what you will do with your chickens unless you take them to bremo and thus bring them here 
i suppose robert would not eat laura chilton and don ella mackay still less would he devour his sister mildred footnote these were the names of some of my sister's pet chickens End note. i have scarcely gotten acquainted with the young ladies they look very nice in the walks but i rarely get near them traveller is my only companion i may also say my pleasure he and i whenever practicable wander out in the mountains and enjoy sweet confidence the boys are plucking out his tail and he is presenting the appearance of a plucked chicken two of the bells of the neighbourhood have recently been married miss mattie jordan to dr cameron and miss rose cameron to dr sherrod the former couple go to lewisburg west virginia and start to-morrow on horseback the bride's trousseau in a baggage wagon the latter to winchester miss sherrod one of the bridesmaids said she knew you there i did not attend the weddings but have seen the pairs of doves both of the brides are remarkable in this county of equestrianism for their good riding and beauty with true affection your fond father r e lee to his daughter agnes about the same time he writes lexington virginia october twenty sixth eighteen sixty five my dear agnes i will begin the correspondence of the day by thanking you for your letter of the ninth it will i am sure be to me intellectually what my morning's feast is corporeally it will strengthen me for the day and smooth the rough points which constantly protrude in my epistles i am glad robert is with you it will be a great comfort to him and i hope in addition will dissipate his chills he can also accompany you in your walks and rides and be that silent sympathy for he is a man of few words which is so soothing though marble to women he is so only externally and you will find him warm and cheering tell him i want him to go to see miss frances galt i think her smile will awake some sweet music in him and be careful to take precautions against the return of the chills on the seventh fourteenth and twenty-first days i want very much to have you all with me again and miss you dreadfully i hope another month will accomplish it in the meantime you must get very well this is a beautiful spot by nature man has done but little for it love to all most affectionately your father r e lee about the first week of november we all went by canal boat to bremo some twenty-five miles up the james river where we remained the guests of dr and mrs charles cock until we went to lexington my sister agnes while there was invited to richmond to assist at the wedding of a very dear friend miss sally warwick she wrote to my father asking his advice and approval and received this reply so characteristic of his playful humorous mood lexington virginia november sixteenth eighteen sixty five my precious little agnes i have just received your letter of the thirteenth and hasten to reply it is very hard for you to apply to me to advise you to go away from me you know how much i want to see you and how important you are to me but in order to help you to make up your mind if it will promote your pleasure and sally's happiness i will say go you may inform sally from me however that no preparations are necessary and if they were no one could help her she has just got to wade through it as if it was an attack of measles or anything else naturally as she would not marry custis she may marry whom she chooses i will wish her every happiness just the same for she knows nobody loves her as much as i do i do not think upon reflection she will consider it right to refuse my son and take away my daughter she need not tell me whom she is going to marry i suppose it is some cross old widower with a dozen children she will not be satisfied at her sacrifice with less and i should think that would be cross sufficient i hope life is not going to desert us too and when are we to see you i have received your mother's letter announcing her arrival at bremo tell your mother however to come when she chooses and when most to her comfort and convenience she can come to the hotel where i am and stay until the house is ready there is no difficulty in that and she can be very comfortable my rooms are up on the third floor and her meals can be sent to her tell rob the chills will soon leave him now mrs cock will cure him 
give much love to your mamma mildred rob and all at bremo your affectionate father r e lee miss agnes lee colonel ellis president of the james river and kanawha canal company placed at my mother's disposal his private boat which enabled her to reach bremo with great ease and comfort and when she was ready to go to lexington the same boat was again given her it was well fitted up with sleeping accommodations carried a cook and had a dining-room it corresponded to the private car of the present railroad magnet and though not so sumptuous was more roomy and comfortable when provisions became scarce we purchased fresh supplies from any farmhouse near the canal bank tied up at night and made about four miles an hour during the day it was slow but sure and no mode of travel even at the present day could have suited my mother better she was a great invalid from rheumatism and had to be lifted whenever she moved when put in her wheelchair she could propel herself on a level floor or could move about her room very slowly and with great difficulty on her crutches but she was always bright sunny-tempered and uncomplaining constantly occupied with her books letters knitting and painting for the last of which she had great talent on november twentieth my father writes to her from lexington i was very glad to hear by your letter of the eleventh of your safe arrival at bremo i feel very grateful to colonel ellis for his thoughtful consideration in sending you in his boat as you made the journey in so much more comfort it is indeed sad to be removed from our kind friends at oakland who seemed never to tire of contributing to our convenience and pleasure and who even continue their kindness at this distance just as the room which i had selected for you was finished i received the accompanying note from mrs cock to which i responded and thanked her in your name placing the room at her disposal the paint is hardly dry yet but will be ready this week to receive the furniture if completed i know no more about it than is contained in her note i was also informed last night that a very handsome piano had been set up in the house brought from baltimore by the maker as a present from his firm or some friends i have not seen it or the maker this is an article of furniture that we might well dispense with under present circumstances though i am equally obliged to those whose generosity prompted its bestowal tell mildred i shall now insist on her resuming her music and in addition to her other labours she must practise seven hours a day on the piano until she becomes sufficiently proficient to play agreeably to herself and others and promptly and gracefully whenever invited i think we should enjoy all the amenities of life that are within our reach and which have been provided for us by our heavenly father i am sorry rob has a return of his chills but he will soon lose them now ask miss mary to disperse them she is very active and energetic they cannot stand before her i hope agnes has received my letter and that she has made up her mind to come up to her papa tell her there are plenty of weddings here if she likes those things there is to be one tuesday miss mamie williamson to captain eoff beverly turner is to be married the same night to miss rose skinker and sweet margaret will also leave us if they go at three a night there will soon be none of our acquaintances left i told agnes to tell you to come up whenever most convenient to you if the house is habitable i will take you there if not will bring you to the hotel i wish i could take advantage of this fine weather to perform the journey End of chapter ten